Hi everybody, thanks for uh, coming out tonight. We're about to get started. Um, so this is the return of our Labrador Institute speaker series. We've been on hiatus for the summer. Um, this is a new thing for us. We haven't uh, um, invited any uh, political candidates in the past and uh, we'll see how this goes with our three uh, federal candidates. If that goes well, maybe we'll try it for our provincial candidates as well. Um, and so the idea was just to give all three of the federal candidates an opportunity to come in and present their uh, their platform that they're running on. And then um, at the end of that, we'll take some questions as well, if people have questions. And I'll just ask that the questions stick to the, to the platform that's been presented tonight. Um, and uh, so without further ado, um, our speaker tonight is Peter Panashway, the candidate for the Conservative Party of Canada. And uh, we all are familiar with Peter. He's been our MP before, and he's uh, vying for that position again. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Panashway. Um, yeah, I can get you a little table if you want one. Please, just give me one second. Anyway, <clears throat> I'll introduce myself. Um, as you know, um, my name is Peter Panashway. I, I am um, the candidate for the Conservative Party of Canada. I am married uh, to Mary Ann Panashway. We have four children. Uh, we have six grandchildren. <laughs> so we're very fortunate. We are never bored with uh, our grandkids. And uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, to start off, I just wanted to make a, um, make a presentation. Hopefully it will be short and interesting. And uh, I'll take questions after uh, my presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, the university for putting on the uh, this um, this uh, sh show that allows us for candidates to make a, uh, to make our, our uh, point of views uh, heard. <clears throat> so the question is, what is this election about? For me, I'm not so much worried about what's happening outside of Labrador, as you've seen in the when I was the minister of, uh, of Labrador, I uh, gave land Labrador. I, I focused on Labrador, and that's where I was elected from, and that's uh, where my constituents are. So the question I, I you know, I, I look at Labrador and I say, okay, you know, uh, what are what's our needs? The population of Labrador is only 30,000 people. The um, the land mass is like close to 300,000 square miles. It's a huge land mass. So Labrador is, is the third largest riding in the country. And, yet, and we're the smallest population of all the ridings. So we're a very unique, uh, we're a very uh, unique position. And I think uh, we need to be cognizant of, of, of that and, and accordingly you know, play our role to make sure that our interests are looked after. <coughs> now, Muskrat Falls is a, it's a huge project. It's uh, six. Uh, it started off as being six point three billion dollar project. It's going uh, going to uh, another ten percent uh, of the cost. I'm hearing, but um, and it's created uh, obviously a huge economic boom for for Labrador. And there's a lot of uh, um, Labradorians working, and uh, and it, I think it's good. I supported the project right from the get go, and uh, I've never. Uh, um, I'm not one of those people that says I support the project on the condition of I, I support the project. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, um, when I was the Grand Chief of the Inno Nation, I've done two of these projects. The first one was under uh, um, uh, under the Liberals with Roger Grimes, and that didn't go anywhere, uh, even though we had concluded an agreement. And the second one was with uh, Danny Williams, and this is what's uh, what's there now. And so <coughs> it's interesting. Um, um, 
when when we signed the uh, the uh, the uh, the agreements with uh, when the Indonesian signed the agreements with uh, with uh, the province in the Fitz and uh, what's known as Josh Badavan Agreement, uh, he was uh, uh, summoned to uh, attend on behalf of the of, of Canada to sign the agreement in Natwashish. It was funny because uh, my signature was on one page of the uh, of the Inu side of the document, and I was signing on behalf of the of government. So I was, you know, so I tell people, I said, hundred years from now, kids are going to look at this agreement and say, his signature is on both sides. <laughs> so that'll be, it'll be an interesting discussion. Yeah, what happened was John Duncan was John Duncan was supposed to go out and sign the document, but he took sick that day, and uh, so I ended up going. And uh, <clears throat> with regards to uh, Muskrat Falls, I remember uh, uh, I received a call from Ed Martin on. Uh, uh, November 28th, I think it was, and uh, he was uh, all in a panic because uh, they were having problems getting the loan guarantee signed off. And of course, it's um, this project would not proceed without the loan guarantee. It's too big for the province. So I said to Ed, I said, well, I said, leave it with me for 24 hours and I'll get to work with it on it. And uh, so this was Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And 24 hours later, uh, um, six o'clock on Thursday, we had it done, and uh, three hours later, it was approved by Nova Scotia and, and the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, so we we're on the flight uh, the next day to uh, Goose Lake to sign the, the loan guarantee terms and terms and conditions of the agreement. So, <clears throat> so I'm very proud of that because it's it's a huge project, and it's probably one of the uh, um, the biggest projects I'll ever be I'll ever be involved with, and uh, and having a signature too or involvement with, and so I'm very pleased with that. <clears throat> and the thing I guess uh, that I want to uh, remind people is that uh, Muskrat Falls will end uh, in 2017, and now they're saying 2018. So that's a couple of years from now. So the question then becomes: <clears throat> in two years. Most of the people that are working on the site, most of the people that, that are there will be heading back to wherever they're from, whether they're from Newfoundland, Ontario, and other places. And the people from Labrador will be laid off. And the thing is that uh, most people are not talking about is that uh, this project ends in 2018. There'll be something like 38 people running the maintenance of, uh, of uh, Muskrat Falls. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> so the question becomes like, uh, if we, you know, if we don't have, uh, you know, once the project is done, and uh, Ed Mark was on the other day and he was talking about uh, about uh, Gull Island, and he was saying that the uh, they won't be ready until 2025. Which means there's an, there's an eight year span of which there will not be a huge um, resource development in, in Labrador. So most of the people that are that are there now will be unemployed. And the problem with that is that uh, is that there isn't a, um, you know people are being paid uh, um, huge uh, salaries and wages, and it's going to have a huge impact on the people that are working there. Because they're not going to want to uh, go back to uh, to the work that they did at, uh, say, Tim Hortons or the service sector in Goose Bay or other places. It's going to have a a, a, a huge impact on, on the people themselves. Now, <clears throat> having said that, with um, with Muskrat, Muskrat Falls being um, um, winding down in a couple of years, IOC is not doing very well. And I'm told, uh, or uh, um, by the experts, I've talked to a few, there doesn't seem to be a uh, sign that the, uh, the price of ore will rebound until 10 years. Which means that uh, next year, within the next uh, 52 weeks, it's going to be very important for IOC. You know, uh, uh, what are they going to do? Uh, are they going to be laying off people? How will they uh, survive until the next, uh, the next turnaround? So there's two big projects that will be uh, winding down, could potentially be winding down next year. And that's going to have a huge impact on, uh, on Labrador. 
And you have to keep in mind what I said earlier. There's only 30,000 people in Labrador. So any huge layoffs like that's going to have a huge impact on the uh, on the population, but in particular, in particular to the young people, because as you know, young people have uh, are working on these projects, but also have returned from other places where they worked, and they're looking to stay in Labrador. So there's a there's a period of which uh, there's going to be a, a concern, <coughs> and then you have a. Uh, um, uh, five wing. Now, five wing is something that I worked very hard while I was in uh, in government, and um, I was very close to getting a ten year agreement, and um, but I didn't uh, 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 was unable to have it signed, and then when I lost the election in 2013, it disappeared. But I managed to um, uh, convince people that it needed to be extended for uh, for a couple years. Um, until the, we could figure out uh, what the next steps were. So right now, the, the agreement on Five Wing will expire in six months, March of 2016, and uh, and hopefully it will continue. And I am of the view that uh, that uh, um, that uh, I'm in a, a good position to to ensure that we have a, an extension uh, to the Five Wing uh, agreement. And I think I would be in a better position to, to deliver that because I think the, it's quite clear it's going to be a conservative government in the next election. And I think um, because I know the people I work with, the people I know, all the cabinet ministers, I know how the system works. I'd be able. I mean, a very good position to deliver for uh, for Labrador. Now, <clears throat> it's. Um, I've made it known that I that I that uh, it makes a lot of difference being on the government side. It's it's amazing what you what you can accomplish, particularly if you are able to work with the cabinet ministers who know the system, work the system. I, for example, as I've said, I was able to deliver a 6.3 billion dollar loan guarantee for Muscat Falls, which is a huge uh, um, benefit for uh, for Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And uh, another thing that people wouldn't have, would not know or would not have heard about is a project uh, Alderon and Lever Iron Mines and uh, um, there's a couple other smaller companies that were desperately looking to, to ship their ore from uh, Lab West to Satil. And of course what happened was uh, IOC would not uh, agree to have them ship use their dock because that's theirs and they're not interested in having other companies use their dock. So there was a table, there was a proposal on the table, they were prepared to put money on the table uh, to build a new multi-user dock for, uh, for that region which they all could use and they were looking for, uh, uh, for 55 million dollars as a federal contribution. So of course they all came to me because I was the regional minister for Labrador and I was in good position to make that argument. So I took it on. And uh, after several weeks, I was I had the uh, the 55 million dollars required to build the 220 million dollar multi-user dock. And so uh, Denny Lavelle and myself, um, after we had all the cabinet approvals, uh, flew to Satil, and uh, along with the, uh, the the other mining companies, we signed an agreement of worth for a total package was worth 220 million dollars, and the federal share was 55 million. And that project was just completed this spring. So now there's a, there's a facility, there's a dock waiting to be used as soon as the, the, uh, the iron ore prices uh, return. So that was something that I was able to, uh, uh, to deliver. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned that because I think that uh, in the event of, uh, of IOC um, looking to uh, um, to recover some of the cost or to, to keep the cost in line with what they can afford or prepare to spend for the next few years while they, they wait out the, the downturn. I think the federal government has a responsibility uh, to uh, find a way to help contribute to, uh, towards the cost of uh, IOC. And that's where I'd like to take on that responsibility and, and find a way to, uh, to, uh, to help and uh, and um, obviously, as I've said, it, it's uh, it's 
it's useful and beneficial to be on the on the government side to be able to deliver these things. <coughs> so with those, um, you know, you know, two items of Muskrat Falls, uh, of course, Five Wing and the IOC, that it's going to have a huge impact on on, on Labrador if we. Uh, um, if, uh, if all three projects uh, fail and uh, and uh, and aren't able to uh, to rebound, so I'm very concerned about that. <coughs> so what I'm proposing, um, given that uh, um, that there's potentially a, a eight-year period where potentially there could not be it couldn't be a would not be a, a resource. Uh, uh, economic development. Um, what I'm proposing to is to start looking at ways to get ready for the for the next phase. So I'm <clears throat> so what I proposed was uh, building a road from Goose Bay to the North Coast, and um, and because of the, my accomplishments, I know I can I can I can raise that money and deliver that type of money. I know, for example, um, there is a federal contribution. Um, that was made $300 million for a road between Inuvik and Tuktoyaktuk. And it's expensive out there because it's of the permafrost. So they, uh, there's a special uh, way of uh, working with roads up in, in the areas of where there's permafrost. And, uh, and it's very expensive. So my thinking is that, uh, that if we can raise $300 million for a road for the North Coast, then that, would, that should uh, make a significant dent uh, you know, towards name. So that's how I see it. And with having a road, uh, <coughs> with having a road up to the north coast, I think it solves uh, many problems. Of course, the Indian nation and the um, United States government would have to be uh, would, uh, would have to be consulted and other uh, other players, other people, other <laughs> stakeholders. But having a road up uh, to the north coast solves many problems. It helps they bring down the cost for food, transportation, and uh, electricity would follow, obviously, and uh, fiber optic. But you need the road first in order to have these other uh, fiber optic and, uh, and, uh, and transmission for electricity for the homes. I remember in, uh, in uh, um, 2011 campaign, I was, uh, it's going door to door in Maine, and this lady uh, um, talked to me about uh, transportation services. And she was explaining to me that uh, a, a woman that is uh, due or pregnant in Maine has to travel to Goose Bay four weeks early uh, to get to uh, Goose Bay. And that's two weeks earlier than the other communities. And that's because of any emergency that could arise. So the doctors, I guess, prefer to have the the people in that name travel uh, two weeks earlier than the other communities on the North Coast. And she thought that was very unfair because uh, uh, she's away from her family, from her kids, from her community, and, uh, and and she didn't think that was right. So I always remember that story. And, I, and obviously, the one of the solutions that I thought was is to find a way to uh, um, to build a, an, air, an airstrip up in uh, Maine. And as a matter of fact, I started on that project because uh, I started meeting with all the cabinet ministers that were that would be required, for, for example, the transportation minister and the province, and they agreed to do a study to uh, to do some wind analysis in in Maine to get a sense as to where it would be the best place to build a an airstrip if they were to build one. And uh, so that was a huge uh, commitment that I that I got from the uh, from the um, from the ministers and the province. And uh, of course, uh, since uh, I left, I've uh, you know obviously there's there's no one to uh, to carry the ball or to lobby for for the project because it's, you know if you're not there then there's always competition for money this you know for uh, for uh, for projects. So um, as you know, you know if you're in the opposition or the third party, you know you don't have a say of what happens on the in cabinet or in government. Another project that uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we all know how important uh, internet is to all of our families, to all of our children. But my uh, my ten-year-old uh, grandson he gets very upset when there's when the internet is down, 
And so it's very important, obviously, and it's important for the economy, it's important for the people that are working on the internet, but it's also important for students and, and uh, other people. And that's why I think uh, uh, there's money there for, uh, for infrastructure for uh, uh, fiber optic. And I think it's important that uh, that uh, that I'd be you know I'd be sent to Ottawa to to lobby for that uh, money to run a fiber optic line from Goose Bay to South Coast and over to Newfoundland. When we uh, built the, uh, I remember I had a phone call from um, uh, before they built the uh, the fiber optic line from from Labrador City to Goose Bay. I had a phone call from uh, Ed Martin, and uh, he was explaining to me that they were running a, a line from. Labrador City to Muskrat Falls, but that was it. And if we wanted the line to continue to Goose Bay, we would need to make a federal contribution. And um, and I think we've, uh, the project was worth something like 20, $23 million, I think it was, and both province and the feds contributed uh, a couple million dollars each. And um, so they continued to run the line from Muskrat Falls to Goose Bay. And then I lobbied for additional uh, $2 million to run it to North Um And so that, that's why we have the, uh, the fiber optic line to, to you know, to, to, to North Sturber. And, uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> the original plan was to run the fiber optic line um, from Lab City to Goose Bay down the south coast, which would give you the, the circular uh, loop because if, if there was ever a forest fire, for example, on the Quebec site, all of us would be down uh, with our internet because there's just one line uh, going out of uh, Labrador. But if you had a loop that goes to uh, uh, the south coast and to Newfoundland, then if there was ever a fire in uh, Quebec, it wouldn't matter. We'd still have a, a connection to the south coast, through south coast. So that's something that I, that I, that I think is very important to be able to... Uh, um, connect all of the uh, all of Labrador, and uh, as I've said, you know, the, it's important that uh, that uh, that we have the uh, um, the roads as well up to the North Coast, but then other you know such as the fiber optic and transmission lines or the electricity line would be able to run up the North Coast. That's also very important, and. Uh, you know, I don't have to explain to you, I guess, uh, getting back on the road, how important the roads are and the benefits of the, of the road. I've been watching my, my uh, Facebook and uh, responding to some of the issues. And uh, there are people on the line that, uh, that have, no, uh, um, have no sense of, uh, or no vision. They, they think we, you know, uh, what we have is what we should have. There's no forward thought, there's no, you know, people don't have any big ideas. You know? Whereas I, I, those of you that know me, I, I've accomplished many things in my in my short life. Um, I was the Grand Chief of Inu Nation and I've accomplished, uh, you know, relocation for Natwashish along with other leadership. Um, I've accomplished um, uh, Boise's Bay, Muskrat Falls, redress on the Upper Churchill for the Inu. And, uh, all the programs and services for our community, and uh, and it hasn't been easy. I, mean, the, the, I, I won't. I'll, you know, I'd be lying to you if I said it was easy, because those of you remember, remember in 1990 um, when I got elected, I was 26 years old, and uh, and prior to 1990, our community, our leadership was arguing for decolonization from Newfoundland, from Canada. You know, the leadership wanted their own land. We are, you know, we were arguing that we should be left alone. You know, the settlers should move away. And in 1990, I said, uh, "That's that's not that's not reasonable. That's not practical. That's not sensible. We need to integrate. We need to sit down with others." And uh, and so when when I was selected in 1990, I moved the direction of the organization in a different direction. I sat down with governments, both federal and provincial, and then I sat down with the industry. And that allowed us to get involved or to access or talk, start accessing programs and services for our community. <clears throat> I remember in, 19, in 1990, when I first got elected, I had a visit from uh, 
from uh, a couple of, you know, three gentlemen from, from the old Davis Line, or was known as Davis Line. It was uh, George Rich, Cody Poker, and Mark Newey. They said, uh, we have a lot of problems in Davis Line. We don't have any running water. Our houses are falling apart. The land is moving an in inch a year. So that tears the community part because it was built on a slope on a hill, the community, and there's no room to expand. And uh, so they said, okay, what are we going to do? I said, why don't we do what other people do when they have problems? Let's have a conference. <laughs> so, so, so we organized the conference uh, amongst the Eno Nation and the, and the community of uh, Davis Sloan. We sent out a whole bunch of letters to anyone we could think of. And, uh, and uh, so <laughs> we got a few people to come to the, to the meeting. That was uh, uh, Bill Rumpke was in opposition at the time, so he showed up to our meeting. Uh, Harold Marshall showed up for the province. And all their uh, all the provincial uh, um, provincial workers. So we sat down and we all talked about the condition of the insulin. And uh, it was very hard at the beginning to believe that you know that we could raise enough money to move the whole community. And uh, and but we kept at it. And then other things start to piling on. There was other issues like gas sniffing. People were interested in the story. As soon as CNN came on the scene, and London Telegraph, I think it was, it changed everything. Suddenly, like, Davidson is on the, it is on the news. And suddenly we were getting uh, uh, phone calls from the ministers looking to have a meeting to try to see if we can resolve the issues. And I remember uh, all the government officials saying, let's have one more study. But I said, we already have 32 studies saying the community, you know, needs to be, um, uh, found another location or something else to help the, the, the water situation. And But they insisted one more study, but we said we have to have relocation as a part of the terms of reference. No, not going to be on. We just have to see how we can help you in Davis Island. They were looking at different options. They were even talking about it, bringing in a ship which would supply water for Davis Island for the, for the winter. All kinds of ridiculous ideas. <laughs> and then <coughs> we went to see um, uh, John, Cro John Crosby, who was the minister for regional minister at the time. So we sat down with him in Ottawa and we said, John, we're having this one final study for Dave Sloan. We want relocation as part of the terms of reference so that we, you know, we don't have to do any more studies. But they're proposing, you see, is that to do the study and then we have. Uh, Another study, if it, if it indicated they couldn't find a solution within the community, and uh, so he said, "Look, let's have one more study, and and relocation is going to be part of the terms of reference." And the contract went to Church Street Engineering. He did all the analysis, all the studies, and the report came back, and they said, "There's not enough water in the Eastland. There's no room to expand, and you can't build a new infrastructure on a, on, a, on a community that's that's slipping an inch a year." And then we had a report that said the community had to be relocated. Out of that came the uh, the final agreements to move the community. And that was in the final analysis was worth $150 million. So when I hear people having the um, these um, comments about uh, one guy said, uh, um, yes, we'll have a road to North Coast, but it won't be in my lifetime. And I say to myself, you know, just stop and think and think big and start believing in yourself and start believing in Labrador. And that's what we need to do. We need to start believing in Labrador and start building the infrastructure. Look at the stuff that I've accomplished in the two years that I was there. I was able to accomplish that because I believed in myself, I believed in people, I believed in Labrador. And I was there for Labrador. You all know I, I was there for it. Because Newfoundland just about uh, tore me apart because I was always for Labrador. The money was flowing to Labrador, I delivered for Labrador. And uh, as a matter of fact, one, I remember a provincial cabinet minister was very upset with me because I was just flowing the money to Labrador. He said, I, I don't have to remind me, remind you, he said, Labrador is only 5% of the population of the province. And I said, yes, but look at all the infrastructure and requirements in Labrador that we need to uh, catch up with. We don't have roads, we don't have electricity up the north coast, we badly need those, uh, those infrastructure. And that's the argument that I've always made. 
And even in the, you know, in the meetings that I attended in Ottawa, it's always about Labrador. And that's when I when when I when you hear me say uh, when I, when I, when you hear me say I'm 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 a partisan. That's and that's what I mean. I'm partisan for Labrador because um, I don't think we've ever had an MP that went to Ottawa to defend the interests of Labradorians, all Labradorians. And that's why I believe that I can deliver for Labrador because I was there for, for, for my constituents. You know, uh, <clears throat> some people think I'm a, I'm a career politician. Really, I, I'm not. I'm a lobbyist. I'm an advocate. I'm not interested in going to Ottawa to sit in, that, in the opposition and make a career out of that. Just not interested. I'm interested in doing good for Labrador. And I think it's come very clear to me and others that uh, it is going to be a conservative government. And that's why, to me, it makes more sense uh, uh, to send me back to Ottawa and start working for Labrador, as I have in the two years that I was there. And uh, I think I've, uh, I've. Um, I finished uh, my my uh, my, uh, my presentation, and if there's any questions, I'll certainly um, entertain to answer those questions. Thank you, Mr. Pashway. So uh, we'll have take a few minutes for any questions now. If anybody has uh, questions for Mr. Pashway, he's kindly agreed to stick around and answer a few questions. I'll just remind everybody that we are streaming this onto YouTube. So uh, just keep in mind that uh, your questions and your language is being uh, broadcast <laughs> over the internet. So uh, we'll just, and it'll be archived on the LI uh, webpage as well. So you'll, if anybody, uh, you know anybody who wasn't able to make it tonight, you can actually um, have, uh, tell them where they can find it. They'll be able to watch it in the future up until the election comes around. So I'll let you answer your questions. Uh, Mr. Panashwe, you you talked about the uh, five billion dollar loan guarantee um, on the project Muskrat Falls. Of course, near and dear to my heart in an opposite way than it's near and dear to yours. It's now at eight point five billion, and that was over a year ago. It is only one point five billion away from being double what that loan guarantee was. The loan guarantee is what. It was needed for that for the province mm -hmm. to go ahead, and you said it was because the province couldn't handle it. Well, we're we're now going to have five billion more, most likely, mm -hmm. and the ratepayers and the taxpayers of this province are going to pay for that with our with our rates. How did the federal loan guarantee in this case help the province? Well. <clears throat> The province needed the loan guarantee because uh, they couldn't afford, they couldn't uh, carry that kind of debt. It's a huge job. You know, you have to remember, Newfoundland has a budget, I think, of $11 billion. This project was worth $6.3 billion at the time. And for them to take on that kind of debt is, uh, it's almost uh, uh, impossible, you know, but I'm sure, you know, they they would say otherwise, but it's a huge debt. And the, the value of the, uh, because of the interest rates at the time, and, the, and, and if, 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 the loan, if the loan is guaranteed by, by the federal government, it has a huge impact on the interest rates. The value of the, of the loan guarantee is almost a billion dollars to the province of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland because of just the, of the, of the interest rates. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is a huge. But my point is that that if it's going to go to a ten billion dollar project, which yes. is likely to do, the interest rate will not be the the low interest rate of the billion, five billion. Okay. The so we're, we're, the, the province only... is going to take the five billion 
over what, what the first $5 billion, and we're going to pay probably quite a bit higher interest rate. Plus, we have to pay for the $5 billion and the $5 billion before that. Just keep in mind that the loan guarantee is based on 6.3. Should the project go bankrupt, that's when that 6.3 kicks in. It doesn't kick any time earlier, right? It's only when the project fails because someone is borrowing the money, the additional money, and the province is doing that. I understand right? that. It's a, it's about the interest is, is the reason why no, the federal it's about, government. It's about the $6.3 billion that the Newfoundland is borrowing. What, new, what, what Canada is saying, we're going to guarantee that 6.3, right? In addition, it's worth almost a billion dollars to both Nova Scotia and, and Newfoundland because of the interest rates and, and, the, and the assurance that the federal government is giving. But should the project go bankrupt, that's what it guarantees, 6.3. The rest is taken on by... by, by well, 5 billion for Newfoundland and 1.3 billion for, for the Maritimes, right? For the Maritime. Uh, part, the Nova Scotia part. My, my question is how did this loan guarantee, if this project goes to 10 billion, how did this loan guarantee help us? It helped you on the 6.3 billion, right? You can only, the federal government, the, the, that's the deal that was made in November of 2012. Federal government said, you're proposing to build a project that's worth 6.3 billion dollars, mm -hmm. We're going to guarantee 6.3. Any overruns, your any problem, budget, it's your problem. It's your problem, right? Which is my point. Right. And the, the other point most people don't understand is that the project, the project is incurred or paid for by the ratepayers, those people that use it. For example, if you think that 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 um, that uh, that Labrador is paying for the cost, it's not, because we're on a different grid. We're on the Church of Falls project. Did you know, in fact, that that the um, the um, experts who are um, who are advising Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro, the, the experts from the United States, have actually uh, suggested that once the grid is hooked to Labrador, that Labrador should pay the same as Newfoundland. That's in the documents from the Public Utilities Board. Well, they may have, but that, that's the agreement is that whoever uses Muskrat Falls is the one that pays. Is that written somewhere, Mr. Panashwa? It is. Where, where can I find that? Well, I, I, I assume you'd have to find the document and, uh, and uh, find it in, 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 the, in the documents that they, uh, that they negotiated. I don't have it with me. It, it, yeah, it's not in the uh, loan guarantee uh, documents. I've read that. No. It wouldn't be cover to cover. It wouldn't be in the loan guarantee because we're only... The federal government only covered the six point three billion dollars. Had nothing else to do, you know. Had nothing else to do with it. But if you, I'm sure if you contact Ed Martin, he'll give you that information. Well, I'm sure he will. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure like he's given us all the other information we ask for. <laughs> um, you mentioned road. Um, Northwest River Council um, has talked about a railroad rather than a road. Um, to go from Lab City to Nain, the spurs off to the communities. Uh, yes, it's expensive, but um, perhaps the mining companies would also welcome that, and um, it might be more usable all time of year, and it might be a tourist attraction, and it's probably less you know, it's more environmentally favorable. I wondered if you'd heard any talk of that. I can't comment on that because I don't know anything about the railways. And the only, I guess, public information that I have is been, and been reviewing is the, uh, the, you know, the roads. And to me, if that makes more, you know, it's more logical to build a road to the North Coast. Because it's just all kinds of benefits. For example, there's a province is looking to build a something like uh, $1.5 billion to build two ferries for South Coast and North Coast. And I mean, they dropped that idea, it's too expensive. But just think about this now, both, I mean, they would have to be provincially involved anyhow because these kind of projects are, are on a 50-50 basis. 
So if the project costs, you know, three hundred million dollars, the feds will bring in one hundred and fifty. The problems are putting the other one hundred and fifty. And, and it's a good big saving for them. You know, and they, and the companies, mining companies. And the company, the mining companies would have to make, make a contribution as well because they would use it. Yeah. And you know, after that, you would have the, the transmission lines as well. Yes. Yeah. So so there's all kinds of benefits. Yeah. Oops. You know that I almost lost my question. Oh. <laughs> but, no, I haven't lost it. It'll come back. Yeah. Uh, what is the uh, would the federal contribution be to the road system going on? I, I know we need it. I, I, I absolutely do. And I was really busted up a bit when I heard that the people up north didn't want it. I thought, well, but I know what I know. The ground is changing for them because the kids are going and they got no way to come back. They can't even visit because yeah. they can't fly in on that day or whatever. So. What is the contribution of our infrastructure uh, and the uh, feds? What's the difference? I, I, I've never known that. What is the contribution? That the feds would put into a road. I, I really have no faith in what the, the federal government would put in there. I, I, I don't. These, normally, these type of projects are on a 50-50 basis. Um, you know, for example, the transmission, the lever transmission uh, highway system, they're all cost shared. And the same thing would apply on the north coast. It would be 50-50. So they're busted now, and they'll be busted worse trying to pay for my stuff fall. So that road system is way far away, obviously. Well, um, that, this is where I, this is where I think. Uh -huh. I mean, I think if you if 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 once you bring people together and and convince that this is the right thing to do, it's amazing what then you know how things are going to uh, you know how things happen, right? Yeah, the same way, for example, when we first talked about uh, uh, relocation of uh, Davidson to Nantwashish. People say it's too expensive. It's not practical. Let's find something else. You know, like, it, and uh, no, no, if, you, I, if you keep at it and have, and, 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 and I, I take your point on vision because yeah. we're very, very short on vision. Right. The fact that this room is not filled tonight just yeah. bothers me no end. I mean, yeah. I mean, we should be hammered down or built, pushed up, whatever. You should be a lot busier than you are at this little tiny group. So I uh, see discouraging, but yeah, the vision to put that road up there about 50 50. Is there any way in the world we can pull ourselves away from the, the anchor that is the problems when Labrador really contributes a lot more and that oil itself can contribute to this, whatever this union is? And don't you think, too, that Labrador should be a partner in this provincial so called province thing rather than just being an appendage? I mean, after all, look, look what we put into it. That's just not fair. Well, that's 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 a point of view, and, and a point of view that needs to be, you know, obviously would need to be acknowledged. But what I do notice is that the contributions that Labrador makes, and we belong to a province, and and uh, of Newfoundland and Labrador, and we don't have a road to the north coast. But we're the only region of Newfoundland and Labrador that doesn't have roads. You can go to Newfoundland and drive anywhere. There's roads everywhere, right? So what I'm offering you is. I'm saying I'm prepared to take this on, and I'm very confident that I can, that I can do this. If people want it, is is to build road to the north coast. I'm confident of that. And if you had asked me, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I would have said, no, never going to happen. But I'm in a different place, a different experience. I know I can accomplish it. So what do you know? Do you know in 2000 uh, in 2012? Population of 30,000 people, an MP, a cabinet minister, I delivered more for my region than any other riding in all of Canada. If you added up all the values of the roads, the fisheries, the airports, the loan guarantee, if you added up all the, 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 the amounts, even, even I was competing with the, the big regions of the big cities. So, yeah, so it's I, impressive. I hear where you'll be running on that. Because that yeah, that is impressive. But for us, uh, I think those few of us, and we're damn few, obviously, we, we don't know because a lot of people won't come out. Yeah. You see it on the losing side. The environment is still very important because sure, hunting sure. and fishing, and the fact that we're going to, our, our fish is going to be jeopardized because of the natural mercury downstream, that's just a killer. Yeah. What basically they, you've said about that when you put this project up there is that it doesn't matter. People don't have to eat fish, uh, so you know that, that that's a bothersome part. Yeah. How would you try to pull back the environmental aspect of this? 
not only this, but any other impact that a loss of the environment means to us because the trees that they've laid down over there is horrendous. And apparently we have to ask for more trees to be cut away because those are the ones from the swamp to cut down that methylmercury level. So where would you, how would you, in all of this, with your pushing the uh, economics, and I see we all have to, how would you mitigate that with the environment? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, there, there's an environmental assessment and they, they take into consideration of all the issues that are being raised. They try to find it, mitigated measures on, the, on projects, you know, that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, mega projects that come, that come forward. And obviously, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a very difficult question to answer because what's, you know, what's, uh, what's fair and what's right for one person may not be the same for other. I always remember a story that my grandfather told me you know, he said, uh, he said, things are changing and changing very quickly. When we pass, you young people are not going to be going back to the land the way we did. So you better find a, a place for yourselves in the in the in the new world, as he would call it. And uh, and I always remember that story. So that's why, for for me, it's, you know, like that, I've always tried to find a, a place for the for the emo people in a, in this society. Now I'm, I'm, I'm playing on a bigger field and a bigger, bigger, um, a bigger, um, bigger role for a larger audience. I'm trying to do the same. I'm trying to find a place for Labradorians and their future and trying to build a, 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 an infrastructure, economic development, so that people, young people, can remain home and be home. And I hear that. I hear that on the, on the street. Right? That, you know, people don't want to be moving back to Alberta or other places. For example, just watch what happens here in the next couple of years. You're going to start seeing, you know, your children, grandchildren start moving to uh, to Halifax. Why? Because there's thousands of jobs there. There's a big, um, there's a 35 billion dollars that's being spent there for the next 30 years, and they're just asking for workers. They're desperately looking for workers, and what they've said is that we're not paying for you to go home. We want you to stay in Halifax. So that means. The, 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 the workers, the children, your grandchildren, your children that move out of here are not coming back because they're going to be in the shipyard. <clears throat> so, so that's, you know, it's, it's that kind of, it's that kind of uh, consideration that has to be made. We need, we need to start thinking big. We need to find a way to, you know, grow our communities. Now, again, are we big enough to destroy the universe we're in? We're only 30,000 people. With that? We're only 30,000 people in Labrador. I'm talking about the environment in a general sense. Now, yes, there's only 30,000. So what you're saying is we are totally dependable. No. No, that's not what I'm no. saying. We have to look after ourselves. We have those 30,000 people. So how do we do that? We're trying to protect our environment and the industry side by side. How do we do that? Well, I mean, I think it's important that we find a way to uh, build up our economies in consideration for the for the land and the animals that live in those in those in uh, in the environment. But I mean, we can't do it without uh, Without the, the economy, you know, we, we need we need jobs. We need people to pay taxes so we can have all the infrastructure and all the services and amenities that we have. We need to, you know we need to we need to drive the economy. That's important. Go ahead. That, that's a circular argument. Right? Go around forever. Maybe Jim, another the other one. Yeah. Peter, um, you mentioned the chance of. Uh, an eight-year downturn. Yes. Yeah, and you, we know what you were talking about: muskrat falls and the iron ore may go down. Five weeks could go yeah. become mothball. But providing you're elected and the conservatives go back in in Ottawa, is there some kind of a plan to get us, the people of Labrador, me, even me, and over here, John, and the younger people, over that eight-year hump? Or have we got to depend on our old age pension and the young people? Do they have to go to Halifax? What can we do? Well, what do you plan for us to do here? This is what I'm, I'm proposing. I'm proposing that we use the eight years when there's going to be a downturn. If you know, um, if, if when Muskrat Falls ends, and you know, and uh, and should the IOC not work, you know, yeah. favorable the way we would like. You know, we need to build up our infrastructure. We need to build roads. We need to, because because you know the economy is going to return. IOC, you know, prices will rebound. 
but it's just that period that we need to get through. So we need to build infrastructure. And that's what I want to be able to argue on, say, you know, I want to build infrastructure, uh, fiber optic to the south coast, build road to the north coast. And uh, I'm pretty confident that, you know, that, uh, that I can build up five wing. And, um, and I'm also very confident that I can, uh, you know, help with, uh, with IOC and uh, making sure that government is, uh, you know, is at the table should, uh, you know, should there be a downturn. Because it's, it, we just got to get through that period where, where you know, where it's going to be challenging. One thing I haven't heard was the candidates and even too much nationwide in the campaigns is about any uh, concentration or interest in building agriculture mm. in Canada and in this province. Like, Echo and I'm involved in that and I'm interested yeah. in it. Why is that? Why don't I hear talk about building the number one industry? Uh, you know, that we use three times a day. The farmers grow everything we eat. And, uh, I'd be lying to you if I said I know the subject matter because I don't. Yeah. And but I can only learn from you if that's important to you and if that's you think something that I should be working towards. Uh, if there's a way of doing it, you know, by all means. It's the same thing, for example, when uh, the first time I got elected in 2011, um, I didn't understand my own influence, you know, because being a cabinet minister was new to me as well, right? And the town of Happy Valley, Goose Bay, called me up and they said, we've been trying to um, find money for wastewater management for the town of Happy Valley, Goose Bay. We're having problems. Let me call a few people. I called. Denis Labelle, who I didn't know at the time, who eventually, who, who ended up being, becoming a very good friend of mine. And I called him up and I said, Denny, I have this problem. The town of Happy Valley Goose Bay is dumping the raw sewage into the Churchill River. And they're looking to propose a uh, wastewater management system. But they're short on funds. So I need that money, uh, what's known as gas tax, to be, some, to be flexible. He said, Peter, let me get back to you. Within 24 hours, he called me back and he said, I'm sending deputy ministers to St. John's. You tell your friends to go to St. John's and we'll meet was sorted out. Within a few days, it was set out. They were able to start the project. Now it's working perfectly. Okay? So, when you, so when you ask me that question, I don't know. But if you share with me what, what you know, and there's a way we can make it work, I'll make it happen. Good. That sounds good. Yep. I have one question from a, somebody that's watching online. If you don't mind taking that, I'll read that out and then I'll be sure. our last question, maybe. Sure. So um, this person's asking, uh, what is your point of view or what will you do in light of the social issues and to address social issues in Labrador, such as poverty, housing, um, uh, alcoholism, uh, high cost of living, food security? Um, the realities of trauma-rooted issues associated with high suicide rates and those sort of social issues. From what can the federal, what can you as a elected member and the federal government do to start to address some of those issues in Labrador? Well, <clears throat> social issues are are dealt with in the two two departments. If you're an Aboriginal under Inuit or Inu, it's handled by the uh, by by federal government, either Indian Affairs and Health Canada. If you're under the other, then it's dealt with by the province. And those policies generally, they're different. And so, so it, it depends on who's asking that question. If, uh, if it's an Aboriginal uh, community, obviously, there's a lot more than Canada, you know, that Canada can contribute to help. And I do recognize that, uh, that, um, that we need to do more. And, and that's the nice thing about uh, uh, being in government and being in cabinet is that you're there while these issues are being discussed. And I'm very knowledgeable about social issues in my community because I am from an Aboriginal community. I'm very familiar with it. And so I'm able to make a contribution in those discussions. And uh, obviously I've made huge contributions in these cabinet discussions because I was always, um, I sat on the social affairs committee, which deals with all of the uh, Social issues in uh, uh, in you know as in, in that mandate, and so I'm able to make a contribution. And so, without knowing the particulars, um, 
if those issues were brought forward, obviously I would be able to make a contribution. Like, like for example, uh, there's a couple of communities that are, that really stand out in my mind right now when I talk about Labrador communities. One is Black Tickle, and the other one is uh, Hopedale. Both communities always, uh, you know, uh, they bother me in the sense that uh, more needs to be done. Um, Black Tickle, for example, is a community that uh, um, does not have running water. Um, I think they told me that they have to go to the other end of the community and the little pond that they have sometimes is not, you know, uh, proper to drink. And, uh, and they don't have an economic development. Um, I was very disappointed with Black Tickle, and I'll say that up front. I offered them uh, a meeting with the uh, Minister of uh, Fisheries, uh, Keith Aspill. Uh, Keith and I agreed to, you know, he agreed, uh, both and I, to travel to Black Tickle. I wanted him to look at the, uh, the fish plant that's there and to see what can we do to help these people in Black Tickle. Because there's a community that, you know, that needs support. And, and it's, it's an odd situation because it's a community that, uh, that's under the province. It's not a, it's not, it doesn't fall under the Indian, Indian affairs. And yet um, I, was able, I offered them the, uh, a meeting with, uh, with the Minister of Fisheries because I was hoping that we would be able to find something for them to do as economic development in, in fisheries. And, and they turned me down. They, you know, they, uh, they said that they weren't uh, available for meetings. Uh, they, were, uh, they were on holidays and a couple were going to the hospital. And, and so I was disappointed with that. Um, but having said that, I mean, it still needs to be uh, addressed. We need, to find a, we need to find a way to help uh, Black Tickle. And I know when I was there the last time, I made sure that uh, uh, I had conversations with Ed, Ed Martin. I said, look, you got to get people in Black Tickle the plane to be able to um, uh, support them to get to Muscat Falls to, to work. And, and he did that. And, uh, but that's, a, that's going to end in a couple of years. So what are we going to do? And so I'm always, I, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that and I'm desperately, I guess, trying to find a way to, to help. And another community is Hopedale. Hopedale is another community, for example, uh, has a, um, in the winter time, you have to drive something like um, 30 kilometers or you know, a couple hours to get wood because the, the, the oil is very expensive. In on, the, on the north coast, and uh, and I remember uh, uh, at the time I was going around with Jim 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 Tutak as uh, you know going door to door in the, in Hopedale, and uh, we visited this uh, elderly Inuit uh, elder, and um, and it was the place was really cold, and and there's and I had, and so I asked her I said you know like um, why would the place was really cold. And she said, I can't afford um, fuel and I can't afford wood because it's very expensive to, uh, and, and she said that she, her grandchildren who are normally would be supported or somewhere else, they're off in school or something. And it always stuck with me, like, you know, we have to do something for the community. And so that's why the road for me um, is part of the, uh, the solution because we can get cheaper electricity to the North Coast that people can afford. And if we make sure it comes from Churchill Falls, then it'd be the same same rate that we're paying here for, for this region. And so that's always been stuck with me. And then I was also visiting, a, um, I think her name was Mary Slick. And, uh, and a couple of kids came into the house and they said, uh, um, my grandmother would like to know if you have any wood. And she said she didn't. And she offered them um, her, uh, her uh, I think it was her garbage, uh, wooden garbage box uh, for, for the tear apart, you know, so they can use it for wood. And I was, it's just, I, I was, it, it struck me as something that, uh, that we need to find a resolution to. And so, and uh, so obviously it's, it's something that I, that I, that I, you know, that I tell stories of when I'm in, when I'm in Ottawa. It's always, it's always good to share these uh, stories to, to other cabinet ministers because they can relate to um, helping to find solutions. 
Great. Well, um, I think we'll stop there. It doesn't mean that people have to leave. If, uh, we'll just turn the I'm going to turn the equipment off, and uh, there's stuff for tea and coffee over there, and some cookies and things. So help yourself. Yeah. But uh, I'd like to say thank you for coming out and being our first participant. Thank you. Very much. I think it went quite well. Thanks to the audience as well for having some good questions. Uh, our next presenter in this series is on Monday at seven, and that'll be uh, Yvonne Jones. Will be here on Monday at seven. So. Anybody who wants to come back and uh, ask questions of Yvonne, you can, or you'll be able to watch that through the YouTube link as well. So thank you. Are you staying here?